thank you. Do know that everything that happens to the environment obviously will affect your health. And that is what we are discussing tonight on Channel One News Hour. And joining me uh, tonight, we have with us Kangede Erastas Kiambi, who is a professor at the Department of Public Health, Pharmacology, and Toxicology at the University of Nairobi. Thank you so much. We also have with us Dr. Andrew Odiambo, who is a consultant physician, assistant lecturer of hematology and oncology, the Department of Clinical Medicine and Therapeutics School of Medicine, as well as the University of Nairobi. They will be putting these issues into perspective for us. What exactly is the link between aflatoxic intake and liver cancer? So we start off with aflatoxin. What is it? Um, <coughs> aflatoxin is um, a metabolite that is produced by fungus. Uh, mostly Aspergillus uh, flavus and Aspergillus parasiticus. <laughs> when it grows on, gr very on maize, very technical terms. Yeah, the, <laughs> but yeah, the, let's call it fungus. <laughs> when it grows on grains, uh, when there is the right conditions, because it can grow, the right conditions are not there, do not produce toxin, but it will spell the grains. But when the conditions are right, that is temperature and humidity and moisture, then it will produce the toxin which becomes toxic to people and therefore causes a lot of problems because when you ingest that toxin in food, if it's in very high amounts, you can get acute mortalities like what happened in Makueni, Makitui and, and in 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you ingest very small quantities over time, that's what we don't see happening so quickly mm -hmm. because those small little quantities are the ones that lead to the risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. Stunting in young children be below five years and also depressing the, immune, the immunity of the person such that the person cannot be able to fight diseases as what he could do if he had his immune intact. Mm -hmm. So those are the effects that we see from this toxin. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we can be able to you know, prevent our food crops from getting aflatoxin? Um, let me say that uh, the problem is uh, very complex and we don't have a single silver bullet for that. Mm -hmm. What we have are a combination of taking methods that can be used. But they will reduce the, the, the aflatoxin in the, in the maize and some of them, because aflatoxin starts in the farm when you grow the maize or you grow the groundnuts, that's when they get infected by the fungus and then the toxin production takes place. Mm -hmm. So you can get them at early during, during uh, crop growth and also at harvest time and storage. Mm -hmm. so, so that's it has got to chain. a lot to do with how we manage our crops. Exactly. All right. We need to be able to know how to manage them properly so that we can be able to take care of that, ex uh, th that growth of the fungus and production of the toxin in the crops. Mm -hmm. We'll be getting back to how exactly can we be able to do that. Uh, but now, what is the link between you know, aflatoxin and liver cancer? Um, let me start by saying that uh, uh, liver cancer in Kenya uh, is a very common problem. We're beginning to see uh, lots of cases um, uh, coming to our hospital in Kenyatta. Um, the risk factors are identified and uh, among the most common risk factors is hepatitis B virus infection, uh, chronic alcohol uh, use which leads to liver cirrhosis and of course the aflatoxin that uh, we've been talking about. Now, uh, what are the figures like? Because you say there is a lot of increase in liver cancer. Well, well, I can quote you some figures from the Nairobi Cancer uh, Registry, which released uh, some figures just about uh, uh, there was a two or four to two or eight report. Um, uh, in in males, it was coming at number five. Um, there's some incidents they used to calculate, and it was coming to about 0 0.9. But uh, the total number of cases were exceeding 1,000 that were reported in Nairobi alone. Um, so it makes it a very common uh, problem and, and, and I think uh, this issue of aflatoxin probably needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has it been, you know, conclusively, uh, have there been conclusive results that show that, you know, aflatoxin could be one of the leading causes of liver cancer? Let me not say leading um, um, because you might get the whole picture uh, a bit misconstrued, but they all work together. Mm -hmm. Picture an elderly male from eastern region who has been exposed to aflatoxin chronically for a long time, this same individual 
may be harboring the hepatitis virus in the liver also for a long time because of uh, some cultural practices, sh sharing of uh, uh, needles and, and the rest, circumcisions, and that puts people at risk for, or for hepatitis B virus infection. And the fact that vaccination was not in place uh, a long time ago when our fathers were growing up. So this same individual, um, um, as you say, takes a lot of alcohol as hepatitis B and also happens to have aflatoxin and the immunity goes down. All those, if you put them in a pot together, will then harm the liver and result in this uh, very devastating cancer called liver cancer. Mm. Yes. All right, uh, let's just go back to you and focus on you know, what we were talking about earlier, um, how we, you know, we handle our crops. Uh, uh, determines the you know the amount of aflatoxin that we have. Uh, probably you can name for us what are some of the food crops that are actually uh, the highest risk for contaminate for being contaminated with aflatoxin. Um, the highest uh, the crops that have at a high risk maize is the first one, followed by groundnuts. Mm -hmm. We have uh, sorghum and millets. We have uh, other beans, for instance, also passes. We also have got other tree crops like like uh, coffee. Uh, those others can also be, uh, aflatoxin can grow on them. A, pr uh, a crop like cassava, cassava gets contaminated with aflatoxin, but not in the same way like maize, sorghum, and millets. Mm -hmm. Cassava is when you, they, they peel the cassava, they cut in pieces and they're drying. That's when it picks the fungus and then it can grow in, but not infection through the, the other value chain, like when it is in the farm, through harvesting and storage, like the maize, the sorghum, and the millets. Okay. So those are the crops that are at risk and very high risk mm -hmm. of being infected with um, the fungus and therefore contaminated with aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So I was doing a little bit of reading uh, before this, and I, s I noticed there was also something they talked about milk. Uh, the fact that you know, animals once they ingest some of these you know, crops that have aflatoxin, and I go ahead and eat an animal. Uh, maybe you can tell us. Uh, the link in, in animals is through the feed. Mm. Our practices are such that people, what they do is they select what they think is good for themselves and they consume that. What is not good for themselves, they think is this not good for us, they give to the cattle, mm -hmm. they give to the chicken, mm -hmm. and even now that we have started aquaculture, they give that to the fish. And in, in cattle, mostly what happens is that the aflatoxin in the feed goes into the, into, the, into the body of the animal and the animal breaks it down and puts up another metabolite of aflatoxin, but not as toxic as the one that was in the feed and that is now comes to all the milk. Mm -hmm. And in, in meat, we, in, in the muscles or in the meat of animals, we don't have very high levels because the transition from food to become to meat, the aflatoxin level is so little, but we have got quite high. You talk about a third of what is in the feed will come out through the milk. And that's the same thing happens when you also, as a person, you eat it, the your liver breaks down the aflatoxin, and a third of that comes through the, either the, the, the breast milk or the uter urine. So those are the roots of excretion. So that's how we get the milk gets contaminated with aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, in the story by you know, Judith, she mentioned about stunted growth, and I'm assuming it has got a lot to do probably with the milk that children consume. Um, not necessarily only uh -huh. the milk, but let me start a little bit further. Uh, children, when, 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 when the conception takes place, at that very early during conception, during the, the, when the time the fetus is growing in the mother's womb, mm -hmm. and the mother is eating contaminated feed, uh, foods, that aflatoxin that is broken down, in the, which is in the blood, will pass to the child. Mm -hmm. So she start, the child gets start exposed when it is in utero. Mm -hmm. And this continues after birth, because m mother's milk, we have found it to be heavily contaminated, over 60% 60, 60 of it. In, some, in, in, our, in, in, in the study we have done, it's contaminated with aflatoxin. They continue drinking the mother's milk until maybe six months, let's say there's this exclusive breastfeeding six months, mm -hmm. they, will start be, they will be consuming the mother's milk. Mm -hmm. But we also know that we, we win them to the cereal-based diets like uji and, 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 and cow milk. Mm -hmm. And those, if they are contaminated, the child will continue getting that. Mm -hmm. And as a child now grows, the first 1,000 days are very critical because that's when the effect of aflatoxin stunting starts. Mm -hmm. Immediately, maybe after stopping breastfeeding, we start seeing the effects start coming in. And you look at a country like, like Kenya, where we have about 43% of children who are stunted, 
that is a very big number. And you look at Africa, you are talking of 2010, we had about 60, 60, 64, 60 million. 2020, we are thinking the, ex the extrapolation is about 64 million children okay. will be stunted. And this is reduction in growth. It doesn't grow linearly like the other children. But not that not the only thing that happens to the child. Okay. The development of the child in terms of cognitive, the way he is able to or she is able to look at things, remember, okay. education-wise, the child becomes not able to do as good. And that is carrying through life because when you don't do well in the exams and that, and that is a way to grow and get better jobs, mm -hmm. even at the grown-up stage, then the person is not having good salary. Mm -hmm. So he carries the, the, the stigma or the problem that he got from aflatoxin mm -hmm. back into adulthood and cannot be able to supply. And then later on in the years, if he is continue consuming the low doses of aflatoxin, then okay. what Dr. Tari has been talking about here, about cancer mm -hmm. will come in. Mm -hmm. So we have got all those effects moving up. So it's, it's time people start thinking what we eat and how that is going to affect the next generations. Mm -hmm. So the danger is that we may have a stunted generation coming up. I don't know, in, I don't want to say the years, but <laughs> if we don't change, that's the that's trend we're going to. All right, Dr. Sari, what are you know the acceptable levels of aflatoxin or rather how much quantity of you know, aflatoxin in the body can determine whether you will get liver cancer or not. Are um, there any acceptable levels? Um, there's, there's different uh, pieces of information that have, have looked at this in terms of uh, uh, how much grams per kilogram body weight um, of aflatoxin uh, can lead to liver cancer. So there's, there's, there's a wide array of, of information. It's still not very well harmonized, uh, but there's a metabolite which can be checked in urine and also some biomarkers in blood. And these have been shown through uh, research uh, to increase your risk of getting liver up to five times. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, what are the telltale signs that you have liver cancer? Well, liver cancer, um, the best time to catch it is when there's no sign at all. And um, this emphasizes the need that um, those individuals who are at risk, those individuals who are coming from aflatoxin endemic areas, those individuals who are known to have chronic hepatitis B or who are known to have cirrhosis, they need to be followed up. They need to have surveillance. They need to have uh, some blood test to be done and uh, some form of imaging of the abdomen to be done uh, once or twice a year so that you're able to get the growth when it is a small two centimeter kind of thing. Uh, which can then be uh, removed. I'll, I'll be pleased to say that um, at Kenyatta National Hospital where I teach and work, um, we've established a liver unit okay. just this year okay. to deal with this exact problem. Uh, surgeons have gone for training, physicians have gone for training, some are back, and we hope to be catching this cancer early. Are people, are Kenyans, you know, really coming to, to test for liver cancer? Are you seeing Not really, increase? not really. Mm -hmm. the, I don't think we've disseminated the information that much out there, but I'll tell you how the situation is now. Um, all patients present with late-stage disease when they have giant growths in their abdomen. They'll tell you, uh, uh, Doc, I've just been sick for three months, six months. It was a pain in my right side of my tummy. I ignored it or I went and I was given medicine for ulcers and that whole story. Um, until it becomes unbearable, they've lost weight, their eyes turn to yellow and they come to hospital with big tumors which we really don't know mm -hmm. uh, what to do about. At that stage, um, your mortality exceeds 85% and there's a chance that if you're diagnosed today with late stage liver cancer uh, in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you're not going to see the next. Yeah, and that's a reality that uh, is shocking, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, lastly, do you think we need to come up with legislation probably, you know, to try and educate the farmers at that level on how exactly to handle their crop and, you know, what levels of aflatoxin uh, need to be present in some of the food supplies because we can't be able to eradicate all of them? Um, maybe not registration. What we need is um, a lot of extension messages, but I'm getting... Uh, uh, listening to a level where I feel there's a fatigue in messages that we are passing through because they don't, you don't seem to see a change as far as the messages are concerned. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need as uh, scientists and as uh, extension officers mm -hmm. to change our tact and look for something else that can help us 
get the message across and our, pe our people change practices and attitudes. Mm -hmm. because so more the, awareness is Yeah, because this is where, where the, the issue is. They need to change. If, the, if, you, if you are really going to eat maize, maize, maize based diets every day, mm -hmm. you need to realize that you are exposing yourself to too much. Mm -hmm. Can you do a diet uh, diversity? Can you have a diversity mm -hmm. of diets mm -hmm. that not only maize? And we need much more. How do we grow this maize? You need to start learning how to, to have good agricultural practices at your own farm. Crop, uh, how do you store good storage, good mm -hmm. harvesting? Mm -hmm. And all this will, be help, will help us to reduce the, 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 the amount of aflatoxin in our maize. Mm -hmm. Because some of those te te techniques that look so easy and cheap and easy to do can mean a lot, can reduce micro uh, the aflatoxin levels by 90%. Mm -hmm. Simple sorting of grains before mm -hmm. even you cook okay. can do that much, much, much. But I don't know why we don't do it. Mm -hmm. But we need to change the messages or change we the messages. We need more awareness I, out there. Yeah, I think awareness is another one. But I want to see a change, not awareness. <laughs> Behavior change is yes, what you're rooting for. Because really, All right. really, <laughs> we need to wrap this up. if you have got a, a, a man man in a town, creates awareness. But who reasons to him? So we, we, we have a, a chance of becoming like that. And we need to change that now before it is too late. All right. That's where we have to end Echo Watch tonight. But of course, you have heard uh, from Kangede Erastas, who is a professor in the Department of Public Health, Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Nairobi, as well as Dr. Andrew Odiambo, who is uh, in the Department of Clinical Medicines and Therapeutics, also as a, at the University of Nairobi, uh, just trying to put uh, into perspective what exactly is the link between aflatoxin and why is it one of the causes of liver cancer. And of course, what they have, has come out is that we need to be more keen on exactly how we grow some of these crops and how we take care of them once they come out of the field. And of course, remember to go for testing, awareness, and behavior change. Well, it's time for Dorina Polos to give us what's happening in the business world. Stay tuned for that. <laughs>